Hi, I'm Frank Quinn. I'm the CEO of Mental Health Australia. Uh, I think we've had quite a week in mental health this week, probably not the week that many of us were expecting with the uh, release of the National Mental Health Commission's review of programs and services. Uh, while we're still analysing that report, which was only fully released yesterday, uh, we just thought it was worthwhile releasing a, a bit of a quick summary so that people can get their heads around uh, exactly what's uh, in the report and where they might perhaps find some of the information that you might be interested in. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that, that uh, the leaking of the report and the context of the discussion of uh, the report in the lead up to COAG, uh, I, I think has been really problematic. Uh, we were certainly uh, hoping that the government would release the report uh, much sooner than they did. Uh, we've been suggesting since they received the report in November that it would be good to get the report out and to get people talking about it and consulting about it. Uh, but I think the unfortunate timing of the leak just before COAG uh, really meant that the government was forced into positions of um, backing away from some of the recommendations sooner than perhaps might have otherwise happened. I think that was a, a bit unfortunate. But nonetheless, we're pleased now that the report's out and uh, we hope that there can be now a bit of an ordered conversation with uh, various stakeholders, uh, Mental Health Australia and its members, uh, consumers and carers uh, and, and others, so that we can actually now take this strong platform that the Commission have provided us and turn it into real action for change. I think the first observation that, that I'd want to make is that uh, this is really quite a comprehensive report. Uh, it's constrained by its terms of reference in that it's looking at uh, Commonwealth programs principally, though it does try to gather some information and make some commentary on uh, state programs. It's principally a report that was commissioned by the Commonwealth Government and for the Commonwealth Government. So I thought, uh, again, forgive me looking at my notes, but we're all uh, catching up with this as we go along. Um, I thought I'd just sort of talk through the, the main structure of the report and make some, uh, some reflections as we go. So it's, the report's available in four main volumes. There's also some supporting documentation. I've seen a, a summary. I've seen an infographic. Uh, I've seen some uh, fact sheets that are produced as part of the report. But the main volumes of the, of the report itself are the, the strategic directions document, which outs outlines the process uh, and ideas for the next one to two years, a document called Every Service is a Gateway, uh, which describes uh, the specific response to the terms of reference that the uh, Commission faced. Uh, what people told us, so there's quite a substantial volume that looks at all of the input that the Commission received uh, in its various submissions and various discussion processes and feeds that uh, back in quite a sort of discussive, qualitative uh, way. Uh, and also then a set of supporting papers that um, collate some of the evidence and provide some of the background research that the Commission uh, um, uh, undertook uh, during the 12-month the review process. The main findings of the, uh, of the report are in um, 25 recommendations across what they describe as nine structural or strategic uh, directions and uh, they're available as part of that uh, summary document which uh, we can point you to at the end. The review identifies, and I'm reading now some direct quotes from the review, which I think will give you a strong sense of the, of the picture of the report. Uh, the review identifies fundamental structural shortcomings across poorly planned and badly integrated systems, with submissions conveying a hit and miss uh, arrangement of services and programs around the country, seemingly based on no discernible strategy creating duplication in some areas and considerable unmet need in other areas. The overall impact it describes as a massive drain on people's well-being and participation in the community. And as we know, sadly, this is consistent with the findings of so many other reviews of, of mental health and mental illness. I think one of the, the thoughts that I've had as I've been reading through the report is that I, I hope that this is not disheartening for so many of the workers who are at the front line of this uh, effort. Uh, there's uh, so much commentary about the sort of failure of the system and so much commentary about uh, how disorganised the system might be that I hope that's not something that's, uh, that's disappointing to those of you who are working at the coalface. Uh, to be fair to the Commission's report, 
it, it certainly doesn't make findings about poor quality work. It surely do, it doesn't make findings about a poor quality workforce. Uh, it, it really does focus on the system and the problems with the system. Uh, and, and I don't think there are many workers in the system who, who wouldn't agree with those findings. The terms of reference, as, as I said, uh, were constrained from the outset because the Commission was required to look at the efficacy and cost effectiveness of program services and treatments, which is broad, to look specifically at duplication in current arrangements and uh, funding priorities for mental health and for gaps in services and programs in the context, and I think this is particularly important, in the context of fiscal circumstances facing governments. So really I think that's code for saying the Commission were constrained from the outset by saying they really had to look at uh, the cost of mental health services and programs within the current funding envelope. And I think that explains some of the recommendations that we see uh, later on. In response to those terms of reference, the Commission found no real evidence that specific Commonwealth funded services and programs were not adding value or that they should be defunded due to lack of impact. So I think there's some encouragement in that finding because what they're saying is there's not room to defund, there's not too much money in the system. Uh, there, there are not programs that it identified that are clearly uh, failures or clearly not working. Uh, and I think that's uh, an important part of the, r the findings. But they also found that the Commission's ability to make judgments about uh, the evidence for these programs was severely constrained by limited information available at state and territory level and by limited information evaluating uh, some of those programs. And obviously that's uh, pretty problematic. And explain some of the recommendations that the, the review makes later on about gathering precisely uh, that evidence that will be required to, to justify programs. But overall, I think what they're largely saying is that the funding envelope uh, uh, um, can't be adjusted too much, it uh, certainly can't be adjusted down, uh, and uh, that particular programs aren't, uh, aren't identified for um, uh, or single out as failures. Reflecting on the current fiscal situation, the review finds, and I quote again, the strongest expenditure growth is in programs that can be indicators of system failure, rather than in areas that prevent illness and will reap the biggest returns to the economy. And I, I think, again, this uh, reports something that we all know. It, it, it is really identifying the fact that our system is based largely on the acute and on the expensive end. That's where the money is, uh, at least. Uh, it does identify in many areas that we don't do a good job even of, of that work. Uh, but it, it really reinforces that need to move our investment earlier so that we can prevent some of that uh, illness, so that we can reap the benefits of investment rather than just uh, meeting the crisis need. And it points to some work commissioned by KPMG uh, as part of the study, uh, the study that follows the, uh, a, a bit of an economic analysis of what some of those scenarios um, might look like. There's a, a link in our uh, online summary, the summary that appears in my update this week, uh, there's, a, there's a link to some of the, all of these inf this information, actually. Uh, as one of the central headline findings that I think people will be interested in is that primary health networks should be renamed and should be called primary and mental health networks, and that these should be key regional architecture for planning and purchasing of mental health programs. So that's really quite a substantial uh, direction and quite a substantial change from where we are now. We know that many programs have previously been uh, purchased and sometimes delivered through Medicare locals under previous arrangements. This report is clearly uh, asking government to focus on primary health networks as a major avenue for uh, identifying need and for rolling out uh, services and programs uh, quickly. Uh, the transition to from Medicare locals to primary health networks is still underway and of course um, those uh, winning tenderers for primary health networks have only just been announced so there'll clearly be quite a, a transitional period of uh, get, getting that underway. Another one of the headline reviews that uh, appeared a, a lot in the press and as I said in my introduction uh, was discussed a lot in the lead up to COAG was the idea that a uh, billion dollars should be shifted out of uh, hospitals and out of the acute end uh, and uh, over time uh, transitioned into um, 
stronger programs in, in the community. A uh, billion dollars sounds like a lot of money. Uh, it is a lot of money. But I think it's also worth noting here that it, it is also a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the uh, expenditure that the Commonwealth makes on, on hospitals. And from the table that the uh, Commission provides, scaling in this, this change over a number of years, uh, they really were anticipating that uh, the full transfer of that money wouldn't occur uh, until 2022. So that's a, a bit of a way down the track. And what the report anticipated was that the expenditure that we made in early inter intervention and prevention would actually have the impact of reducing uh, the demand for those uh, uh, acute um, services. Uh, as I said, the, the minister in the lead up to COAG uh, has ruled out uh, that expenditure. Uh, or that shift of expenditure directly. But I'd hope that in the agreements that we can come to uh, with the states and territories, we can find a way of, of achieving that sort of, uh, that sort of transition and that sort of change of focus because uh, that, that's another area that's been repeated uh, time and time again in various uh, findings of various reviews. We need to get services into the community. We need to get them closer to where people are and we need to focus on early intervention and prevention. So hopefully uh, th that's one of the areas that will be negotiated. Uh, we're currently doing uh, a much more detailed analysis than the one I've just provided to you now. Um, and in particular, we're comparing the findings of the um, uh, Mental Health Commission's report uh, against the um, directions that we'd outlined in the blueprint. It's already quite uh, evident to us, although I, I, I do note that the uh, Commission's review doesn't mention the, the blueprint that we uh, developed over the course of the last uh, 12 months or so. Uh, the report uh, does uh, point to many similar directions and many of the areas that we had identified. Uh, it, uh, it talks about the lack of consistent outcome uh, measures uh, nationally. Uh, it talks about the lack of indicators and targets, another area that we were um, uh, very vigorous in our advocacy on. Uh, it talks about the need for clarity in the roles and responsibilities of the Commonwealth uh, and states. So uh, it's immediately apparent that there are lots of uh, areas of agreement between uh, the work that we did along with you over the course of the last uh, 12 months and many of the recommendations that the uh, Commission has made. Uh, it looks on the face of it like there might be some gaps or, or discrepancies uh, at least. Um, the first that comes to mind is we, th there seems to be no uh, reference in the Commission's uh, report or findings to specific uh, structures or processes to ensure uh, consumer and carer uh, participation in the governance of new arrangements and to ensure that consumers and carers are appropriately uh, represented and that um, leadership is appropriately developed and so on. So again, that's an area we'll, we'll uh, look into more. Uh, overall, uh, I think I'd want to say just in concluding this very initial summary before we get to the details, uh, that the Commission is certainly to be commended uh, for their report. Uh, they've painted a pretty stark picture of the um, circumstances in uh, mental health, uh, sadly circumstances that uh, many of us have known about uh, for a long time. It's very important, uh, I think, for us to give these processes uh, uh, the legitimacy and the, the um, backing that they, that they need to, to bring about change. The real concern is that this could end up being a report that sits on the shelf like the, so many other reports that uh, have gone before it. And it'll do that, uh, I think, if a couple of things happen. One of the ways that uh, this report could be undermined is if what we now see is a sort of breakout of um, confusion and infighting and different agendas uh, across the mental health sector. I think wherever we see that um, uh, that disunity break out, it can give governments uh, a, an easy path not to take action. And I think the sort of unity that we achieved as we developed the blueprint over the course of the last year is the sort of unity that we should be looking to encourage and uh, and continue into the to the year ahead. And the other area that I think where these uh, things can fail is if they're not appropriately owned and managed and uh, and governed really uh, by government, taken on taken on board and and actually prosecuted. 
And that's why in our response yesterday, our initial response to Minister Lee's announcements around the uh, release of the um, formal and final copy of the, of the review, uh, we actually supported the idea that this work needed to be taken to COAG. Uh, we know that that work uh, has been to COAG before. We know that uh, COAG has failed to deliver too many times before. But we also know that without our governments actually uh, cracking this nut and resolving some of the um, challenges that uh, seem to be perennial, that uh, this um, sim this reform simply won't be achieved. We said in our uh, in our blueprint that we wanted there to be a new national agreement on uh, mental health. We note that the commission makes that recommendation also, uh, and we're very supportive of that uh, recommendation. I think that's really the the starting place for so much of of what else flows out of the report. But there are many things it's apparent too that uh, the Commonwealth Government uh, can and hopefully will uh, get on and do. The, the uh, uh, Mental Health Commission have made some very practical suggestions and I don't think we need to let the establishment of new governance arrangements get in the way. That's a bit longer than uh, my usual uh, updates, but uh, again, given the importance of this issue, we just thought it was important to get something out there. As I said, if you have subscribed to my weekly update or if you look at it uh, online at uh, MH Australia's, uh, Mental Health Australia's website, uh, you'll, you'll get all the information and links to some of those uh, documents that uh, I've talked about. We'll be providing you with uh, more information, a more substantial uh, update over the course of the next week. Uh, I'd commend the report to you, read it, uh, and, and I'd also ask you to consider the role that you might play in ensuring that this reform is achieved this time. Because as I said earlier, we don't want this to be just another report that sits on the shelf. Thanks for your time.